Hi everyone, welcome to the Seiki Musings podcast with me, Bill Seiker. It's episode 113 today, it is the 18th of January 24, and today we are looking at whether it's too late to save the West. Uh, so yeah, something which I've been thinking about for a, a while now, but um, something I watched the other day just made me uh, think about it even more, which is, you know, is it just too late? You know, are the problems in the country so great that there's no hope of of doing anything about it? Um, and I, I apologise for being kind of pessimistic about it. And it's, but I think we need to ask that question. I think we need to look at square on and say, is it really too late now to, to solve the problems? Are we just going to, to, to spiral into decline and be lost forever? Um, well, I don't know if the, I don't know the answer to that question, of course, because, uh, because no one knows the future uh, except for God. But I think it's, you know, it's important. It's an important question to be asking. So that's what we're going to be looking at in the in the main section of the podcast. Um, but before we get on to that, as usual, I'm going to uh, share with you some links and things that I've seen over this last few days, which have been interesting, which I think you might uh, you might also like. So let's go through that uh, now. So the first thing is the post office scandal. There was a good article that was written by Giles Fraser on Unheard called will the church follow the post office Um, and its subtitle managerialism is killing communities and i thought that this was quite a a good and um, interesting article and uh, something which you you may know is that paula venels who was the uh, the the ceo of the post office over the time period when all of the, the scandal was kind of happening she is also ordained in the church of england and she was instrumental in writing a, a report about the closure of church buildings for the Church of England. And she was also considered and became within a you know hair's whisker of being made the Bishop of London. So, you know, which is which would have been an unprecedented move, really. But that's the, the level of which the you know where she is when it comes to the Church of England. So this article from Giles Fraser I thought was was a a good take on that. But let me just quote you one paragraph which I thought said a lot to me. Um, Oh, here we go. Um, I thought this paragraph here was um, was really interesting. In the light of the post office scandal, there has been much understandable anger about Vernals personally. Claims that she is somehow morally deficient and in it for the money. I don't quite share this view. In a sense, I think it's worse than that. What the shocking treatment of sub-postmasters has revealed is not so much a story of avarice, but of unwarranted trust in systems. Systems of management, systems of technology, over people. This is the 21st century equivalent of the banality of evil. And now, 700 ordinary decent men and women have been accused and prosecuted for theft, on the say-so of a system of data. Divorces followed, stress, illness, bankruptcy, in some cases suicide. Apparently they thought computer systems, unlike people, could never sin. I think this is such a a telling paragraph about um, the state of the church and the world, really. Um, But particularly the church at the moment. You know, it seems to, to think that what we really need is impersonal systems. You know, we need processes, we need procedures, we need red tape to manage everything. And, you know, hang the fact if people, you know, struggle, get divorces, or if, if people, you know, can't manage, if it treats, if these systems treat people badly, you know, it's just the process. And uh, this is something which you see all over the, the Church of England now. Um, you know, you think about the um, clergy discipline measure and the safeguarding measure. Um, there have been so many problems with, with that, you know, people committing suicide and what have you because of being treated so badly uh, by the process and so on and so forth. You know, it's just this dead managerialism which reduces, you know, caring about people and treating them well to just following a set of following a process, following a set of steps. Uh, without any care and without compassion, without human compassion. 
And I just thought that and that sums up the state of the church at the moment, I think, which is, you know, we need to be treating one another, you know, with human compassion. We need to be treating one another well. And instead, what's happening is that, you know, we are just treating one another with um, you know, impersonal processes. And that's actually worse than human failure, if you like. And I think that that's a point that, that Giles Fraser makes, you know, that it's worse than avarice. You know, that, that um, it's actually this dead managerialism has taken over and uh, it's killing the church and it's killing society as well, I think. But particularly the church. Um, so, yeah, do have a, a read of that. Um, the next thing is an article by Louise Perry on The Spectator called Britain is Soft on Crime. And this was published on the 14th of January. And um, she basically talks about the problems with the criminal justice system in the UK and how uh, we as as um, the, the, you know, the, the criminal justice system in this country is not giving people the punishment that they deserve for their their crimes. Let me just go down and quote you uh, one paragraph here. The people who see the workings of the criminal justice system up close tend to agree with the public that crime levels are too high and punishment is too lax. It's incredible what you see there, continued my proper journalist friend, having raised the issue of magistrates' courts. Some guy will come in having beheaded a grandmother and as a punishment we give him a flat and a job in Waitrose. He was joking, sort of, but you will often hear the same kind of dark humour from police, medics and other professionals who see the system up close on a daily basis. A hot chocolate and a hand job is the typical sentence for most offenders, or so one policeman tells me. And she goes on to, to talk about it um, and uh, say how most people don't, don't realise that this, is, um, this has taken place. Now, I think, you know, this is, again, this is pretty disgraceful, isn't it? You know, the idea that people who commit crimes are not being punished appropriately. I wonder if part of the problem, though, is, is the fact that now almost everything is a crime. You know, that now we have non-crime hate incidents. So the police are busy, you know, uh, policing our tweets and misgendering people on Twitter. And, you know, the police are busy investigating, you know, the hashtag Me Too, where a man might have looked at a woman a bit funny at one point. I mean, I'm, I know I'm exaggerating a bit here, but... It just seems to me in a world where almost everything is a crime, nothing's a crime. And the people who are committing actual egregious offences are not being punished appropriately for it. Whereas the people who've really done nothing wrong are are getting, you know, some kind of punishment. It's, it's crazy. It's an utterly backwards, bizarre world of a criminal justice system. And it seems to me this is what happens when you abandon Christian morality, that you abandon, the, you know, not just the, right, the the ethics, not just what's right and wrong, but the punishment for it, too. Um, I haven't got it on the, on the screen, but there's an interesting essay by C.S. Lewis called The Humanitarian Theory of Punishment, which you might like to to look up where he talks about this. And um, no, I, I just find it that criminal justice is not just I mean it's not the only thing you know I think this whole progressive view has taken over everything and um, I mean I can't really talk about it on the podcast but you know my wife has a bit of experience of this having started in a new school but uh, perhaps we'll go, get on to that uh, in another in another session a bit later uh, you know but the idea that uh, we're being soft on people rather than actually treating bad behavior and and even crimes with the punishment that they deserve um, you know we have gone soft and it's because it's this sort of progressive view this humanity so-called humanitarian view which actually is not humanitarian at all okay let's move on to um, an article on the the daily skeptic published um the 15th of January by uh, Dr. David McGrogan called Why the New Right is Wrong. And let me just quote you um, a little bit of what he says. And uh, he, he starts out by talking about the the New Right, so-called. So think about the ARC conference. If you saw that, I think at the end of last year, 
it's set up by a Jordan Peterson and uh, someone else. But, you know, that he said a lot of the people at this conference were talking about being um, uh, right on culture, but left on economics. Right on culture, but being left on, on economics, as it were. And uh, this is what he says about that. Let me break it to you. This is a pipe dream. While the desire on the part of modern conservatives to divorce themselves from neoliberalism is understandable enough, the simple truth is that there is a very good and obvious reason why parties on the economic left tend towards being left on culture too. And it is simply this. A state which minutely governs the economy is one which minutely governs society as a whole, because economy and society are not in fact separate phenomena, but an integrated whole. This means that if the state is big vis-a-vis -vis the economy, it is going to be big in all areas, and it is going to want to squash or co-opt competing sources of loyalty and authority, like the family, religious and community groups, businesses, etc., which the right holds dear accordingly. The truth of the matter, then, is that conservatives and libertarians both fundamentally need the same thing, a small state, and that the left on the economy and right on culture meme is just that, a slogan without a genuine cause. I thought th this was interesting and it, it sort of goes back to what we were looking at last year with John Locke, the second treatise on government about how the government is us, but that there isn't such a thing as the economy which exists independently of culture and independently of our lives, but it affects everything. And I thought that was a helpful um, article kind of talking about and exploring the differences there. And, um, you know, I, I think personally, the, the, the way forward is that we need the government to get out of our lives as much as possible. You know, just focus on the essentials, which is maintaining law and order and, uh, and actually um, promoting what is right and good. You know, promoting the, the Christian religion, the Christian faith. Um, but um, yeah, we, we've talked a little bit about that. Let's uh, we'll come back to that another time. Okay, I'm going to run through these uh, a bit more quickly now. So um, this is just a little bit of news. But you know, Catherine Burbel Singh School, uh, Michaela School, which is in a deprived part of London, uh, Wimbledon uh, way, I think. But there was in the news it says um, head teacher Catherine Burbel Singh taken to High Court over Muslim prayer ban. Subtitle. Uh, Michaela Community School was subject to a bomb hoax and staff feared for their lives after enacting the controversial policy. So that they've had to put a ban on, you know, pupils taking in prayer mats and, and praying in, in the playground and what have you, um, because they don't really have the space for it. And they, they wanted to make it a fair, fair for all kind of religions and make it a safe place for everyone. Um, and um, yeah, they've had death threats and, and what have you and I, I just thought well it's that it's that whole thing isn't it about you know whenever you, whenever we seem to get religious problems in the the UK of this nature it always seems to be one religion who are the ones causing the problems and I just wonder why it is that politicians seem to be so so blind to this which is not to say that you know all Muslims are, are, are like this or, or or what have you but you know that I think you have to be. We have to be free to to actually say, well, there is one religion who are causing the bulk of the problems, and this is, you know, this is not some kind of something which should be brushed under the carpet or or what have you. You know, I think the the question of Islam is one which is not going to go away just because people want it to or just because people say it's um or islamophobic or is i i don't know whatever so we've got to be we've got to confront these things head on so well done anyway on catherine burble singh do um you know read it and, and and um you know um yeah she needs our support um article here on the brownstone institute by sonia elijah called contaminated we've been their lab rats all along this is talking about the mrna um, injections and how um, they are uh, what well, the argument is that they are novel products they, they've been treated like traditional vaccines but they're actually novel let me just quote to you what 
the Surgeon General of Florida, Joseph Ladapo, um, had to say that they, you know, that um, the Department, Florida Department of Health, have um, you know called for a halt of these uh, these vaccines, and this is what the Surgeon General of Florida had to say in a statement. DNA integration poses a unique and elevated risk to human health and to the integrity of the human genome, including the risk that DNA integrated into sperm or egg gametes could be passed on to offspring of mRNA COVID-19 vaccine recipients. If the risks of DNA integration have not been assessed for mRNA COVID-19 vaccines, these vaccines are not appropriate for use in human beings. That's from the Surgeon General of Florida. So, um, do have a read of the article again I, I i don't i'm mindful of what youtube want to say uh, about you know um all of these things um but yeah do have a read of it and i, I will just add the the line that uh, public health authorities consider the vaccine safe and effective but i just leave that to you to you know i just leave that to you to think that they consider these safe and effective goodness me um anyway Let's carry on. Uh, Neil Oliver, he did a great um, thing oh, the other day, a um, monologue called Lunatics Have Taken Over. And I think, yeah, it was one of his best. Um, do have a watch of that. I mean, if, if you like Neil Oliver, he just seems to, you know, um, uh, I think he seems to put into words what I want to say. You know, that, that you know, that he seems to speak for a majority or perhaps a you know, silenced minority. Or my... Anyway, he seems to speak for people of a who grew up in a certain era, who have certain values, who have just found those values over and over, um, completely, that the modern culture and the modern government and society just completely overrides and ignores those values. And he talks about the bombing campaign in Yemen and, and how, you know, we're not being consulted or, or anything like that. Um, yeah, very, very good. Um, uh, just a couple more things here. There was an interview with Peter Hitchens, which I thought was helpful, on the new Humanum um, podcast, or I'm not sure whether a podcast, but on, on YouTube anyway. Uh, it's just called No Such Thing as Progress. Peter Hitchens on Modern Substitutes for God and the Distortion of History. So um, Peter Hitchens is someone actually who's, who's really grown in my estimation over the last few years. I mean, I liked him, but... You know, I think he's a very brave man and he's really, you know, stands up for the truth. But one of the things I didn't know, which I found out from this, is that he actually um, went to a church with a few other people in the lockdowns and they sort of held a service themselves and sang some hymns inside. And, um, and actually, uh, it seems that someone called the police on them, but the police didn't get there till after they'd gone. So, you know, that was interesting. But I just thought, you know, wow, that's, um, you know, it, you know, when something strikes you, something strikes you. And one of the things that kind of struck me is that Peter Hitchens, I think, would be hated by the members of the um, Church of England establishment. You know, that I, I'm, I'm pretty sure that he would not get on well with, you know, the vast majority of bishops and clergy. And yet here he is, you know, who's a, a faithful Anglican, you know, they're having a service singing hymns in lockdown while they're all, the bishops are all telling people to stay at home, save the NHS, you know, what have you. And uh, yeah, I, I thought that was very telling anyway. That was a telling moment, but a good interview and uh, worth listening to. The final thing is a video by Doug Wilson, which I think may have also been a blog as well. But it's called Things That Go Bump in the Night. And he's talking about the way that um, we, it, the Western world, thinks that the, the universe is, you know, completely cause and effect, you know, materialistic. Um, we, we, we have a, a sort of disenchanted universe. Everything is it's just a matter of cause and effect. We think it's all scientific. We, you know, we think it's just material. And what Doug Wilson is saying is that we need to recover the enchanted universe, the universe where, you know, that we see actual the spiritual side of things, that it's it's God's universe. It's not just a, 
natural cause and effect universe, a naturalistic universe, but that is God's universe. It made me think of something that Francis Schaeffer said. I think this might have been in the um, uh, True Spirituality, but just that when we become Christians, we move from the, the naturalist chair to the supernaturalist chair. You know, the, 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 what, the view of the universe changes. You know, we don't just think about the, the world in, in natural terms anymore, but we think about it in supernatural terms, in terms of God, in terms of right and wrong, um, angels, angels and demons, in fact, and the spiritual side of life. And, uh, yeah, I, I think that too, too much of the time Christians have just kind of succumbed to this naturalistic, materialistic view of the world where we don't see the spiritual side of life. And, and you can see that during lockdown, you know, the way that people just didn't, um, uh, just can totally went along with this, you know, mechanistic view um, of you know, well, if you breathe out, then you, someone else might get infected, which is, you know, well, for one thing, even scientifically questionable, but also I think it's just that cause and effect thing, isn't it? It's it's like, where, where, where comes, you know, doing the right thing and letting God take care of the consequences, which I think is the more biblical approach. So anyway, and that was what it made me think of. Um, I know it's a lot of the stuff that we've covered on the podcast before, so do have a look at that for more. So that's an end to all of the things I've got. There's quite a lot this week, so I'm sorry that that took a little while to get through. But uh, those are the things I found interesting. All the links are down below. Um, so uh, let me know if you have anything that you'd like to share as well. And thank you to people who have been in touch over the last few days. There have been a couple of people. Um, and um, I'm actually going to mention one thing in the main section as well. Um so yeah, you can get you can get in touch with me via uh, Telegram. You can Telegram me. The link is down below. You can leave a comment if you're watching this on YouTube, or you can email me through sacredmusingspod at gmail.com, and that will get through to me. Um, and um, just while I'm here, don't forget if you'd like to support the podcast, then if you're listening on the audio podcast, you can leave me a rating and a review in your podcast provider that'd be super helpful just to let other people know that it's worth listening to if you appreciate it and if you're on youtube you can give me a thumbs up as that helps other people too and if you would like to support me then i've recently moved to give send go um, and that's because I, I think give send go are a really good organization and uh, if you supported me on other things before the new one is give send go and I think I've got in touch with everyone who did support me via stewardship just to let them know. But um, uh, yeah, Give Singo is the new, the new way to support me financially if you would like to do that. So thanks so much, everyone, for all of your support in, in all of those different ways. I really do appreciate it. And I'm so glad that you find the podcast sort of beneficial. So let me move on now to the main section, thinking about whether it's too late for the West. Is it too late to save the West? Well, I was, um, I mean, I thought I'd just start by by going through some of the problems that we face. I know that all of this is uh, stuff that we've covered um, many times over sometimes on here. But when you add them all up, it's pretty incredible, isn't it? You know, that you've got the demographic problem in the West. And by the way, I should say that when I say the West, I'm... As I was writing this, I was mostly thinking about the UK, but I think a lot of these problems would apply across the, the whole of the Western world. So I've called it the West. Uh, but there's the demographic problem, you know, the ageing problem, you know, the, an ageing population. We are having less than replacement birth rates, uh, not to mention the fact that, um, you know, the welfare state is crumbling. Which kind of leads me on to the next thing, the economic problem. And um, not just the welfare state, but really the, the imminent collapse of the global financial system. It seems that fiat money is becoming more and more, um, it, well, it's, it's, it's going south, isn't it? Fiat money, it's, it's, it's not going to, it's looking like it's going to end at some point, sometime soon. You know, the, the financial system just is going to collapse. Um, and that's what it seems to me that, you know, that's what we're facing. Um, we've got the energy problem. You know, you can't run a country on unreliables. 
And it, it just seems to me more and more that we are pursuing an energy policy which is going to run us into the ground sooner or later. That you know we're putting more and more eggs in the unreliables basket. Sorry, I should say renewables. Um, but but that's the problem with renewables, isn't it? That they are uh, wind and solar are certainly in the UK are unreliable. The wind doesn't always blow. The sun doesn't always shine. And in the meantime, we as consumers are just being encouraged to use less and less. I saw an advert on TV the other day about smart meters, and it really annoyed me because it, it summed up everything wrong with the energy policy. You know, saying that get a smart meter, and you know, so we won't need to use so much imported gas and be reliant on imported gas. And you think, well. We've got gas under under our feet, you know, in parts of the country, shale gas, which we're not taking any advantage of. Uh, we're not taking advantage of other means such as nuclear power, you know, that, and you're blaming us for using electricity when, you know, I mean, as today is a cold day here, it's, you know, been minus four, whatever, overnight, it's about two degrees now, I've got the heater on, I've, you know, you need to use it to keep warm. You're destroying human life. Ah, oh, it just makes me want to shout at the TV or at the politicians sometimes, you know. So there's the energy problem. Um, then there's other problems like with government. There's this authoritarianism problem, you know, that governments are getting more and more, in some ways, authoritarian. Power is being handed over to unelected bodies like the World Health Organization, like the World Economic Forum, like the United Nations. And means that our elected politicians are, our representatives are ineffective, un unable to actually do anything. And to, to top all of that off, you've got the rise of BRICS and the end of the US hegemony. You know, that the US are no longer, or, or certainly um, are heading that way, not to be the world's you know main superpower, um, but actually that other countries are rising up and banding together and uh, the western world is looking on very very thin ice indeed um and you could you know I've, I've i've taken a few things here you could go on and on and on about it though couldn't you you know you, this is just the tip of the iceberg and believe me on a day like today i i can i think i can feel what an iceberg might feel like not good <laughs> um have we gone past the point of no return? That's that's the question that I wanted to ask. Have we actually gone past the point of no return now? now because it seems like our institutions, you know, you think about the government or the civil service or universities or, you know, any one of our myriad institutions, libraries, you know, have been almost entirely captured by the prevailing secular worldview how whatever you want want to call that i'm not sure whether woke is quite the right word but it, it seems like they are buying into this sort of secular worldview which is you know just we need more government we need more state interference we need more you know the, the climate change thing the all of this institutional racism it, it all goes together it seems to come as a package whatever it is they bought into it and not only that our institutions have been captured, but young people are being indoctrinated into it through the education system. And I know that there is some hope with young people. I was, um, uh, when I was uh, in, in our old church helping out with the youth group, um, it was it was kind of encouraging talking to to young people. I think they were maybe a little bit more circumspect about this stuff than you know, the media would give them credit for. I think they have an awareness of, you know, what they're being indoctrinated into. But nonetheless, you know, for example, that the, there was a poll on the Daily Skeptic the other day that said young people, I think a third of them think that climate change has been exaggerated. But that means two thirds of them don't think it's been exaggerated. So, you know, two thirds, that's, a, that's quite a lot of young people. Um... So, you know, we, we do have real problems that the, the young young people coming through are coming through with this kind of secularized secularized worldview. And if you, you think about 
the ways that we can change, it seems to me that we are past the point of no return where we can effect change by the ballot box. Certainly in London, if you think about um, London, the mayor of London, you know, that, that's obviously um, coming up now. And um, there was a discussion on the New Culture Forum the other day. I was watching this with um, Peter Whittle and um, saying back in 2016, he managed to get on to the London Assembly as a Brexit, you know, support, uh, sort of uh, UKIP, I think, uh, member. And that was only, what, you know, seven, seven years ago, something like that. Uh, eight years ago now. And he... Um, he said that you know, although that was only a few years ago, things have changed since then. And you think about the way that immigration has changed London and how most of the newer migrants are going to, to vote for Khan, it seems. And that this was Labour's idea from the, the get-go back in 1997, that they wanted this um, partly immigration so that they, they would have a support base. Um, and I think it's it's interesting how... Uh, that that's a cunning strategy you know you get more people into the country who are going to vote for you and who, who are going to be loyal to you regardless and if that if you get enough of them then that's going to any election is not going to be fair in that respect or at least is going to be very um one-sided very rigged so it seems that when it comes to the mayor of London, I wonder if we're actually past the point of no return of voting in someone who's actually going to, to do something sensible. And is that the case across the country as well? One of the things which has been in the news over the last few weeks is the way that reform have been doing. You know, the, uh, the reform party uh, led by Richard Tice. And reform are, I believe, polling at around 10% at the moment. Now, that's unprecedented, I think, for a new, relatively new political party to be polling at such high numbers. And I think it does show that a lot of people are really fed up with, um, you know, the government are really fed up with the current political establishment. So I think there are signs that people are waking up to what's happening in politics at the moment but i i do fear that there are just an awful lot of people who are never going to be persuaded to ditch one of the big traditional parties i think there are a lot of people who just aren't paying attention who think that the conservatives represent what the conservatives have always represented and that labor represent what labor have always represented and that you know that they are never going to to vote for a small party because it's too much of a risk and even if they're dissatisfied with some things they're not dissatisfied enough you know things would have to be really really bad and i mean i think they are really really bad as it is but you know i mean how bad does it have to get for the average voter to vote for for change for reform and are there enough of them in the country to actually affect any meaningful change i don't know about that I really don't. And here's the thing. Even if the Reform Party were able to win a majority, would they be able to accomplish anything? Would they be able to accomplish anything like what they want to accomplish? One of the things which I, I, um, I saw a few weeks ago, there was an interview on trigonometry with Steve Hilton, and he was an advisor to the David Cameron uh, Conservative government. And I think he, he quit sort of um, about 10 years ago or more. But he, um, he'd been in government and he said one of the problems was that the, our politicians are really not the ones in control. It's the civil service or you know, the blob or the deep state. I mean, whoever you, you want to, to call it. It's not our politicians who are really in control. It's others so, you know, the, the, that, that was what they were always rubbing up against when they tried to have this bonfire of legislation. They couldn't because the civil service were blocking it and were making life difficult. So do reform have the, the ability, the capability to actually change that and to effect meaningful change in the civil service and gut it and reform it? 
I'm not sure. I'm not sure it's such a thing is really possible. And if it is, it's going to be a heck of a long battle. And, you know, I think we need change now, you know, not after a massive battle with civil servants and, and with reforming the civil service and, and so on. So I just wonder if reform actually even, you know, reform recognise the scale of the problem that we're facing. And to be honest with you, I do wonder whether Richard Tice can provide the leadership that we need. You know, I, I like Richard Tice. Um, I think he, he does speak, you know, good sense. But I'm not sure that I could have complete confidence in him. Like one of the things which um, I know I've mentioned once before is that you know, when it comes to politicians, I think character matters and integrity matters. And I know that Richard Tice and Isabel Oakeshott are now together, but they both left their husband wife, I think, to, to be with one another. And uh, I mean, I, I know that that's a common thing these days. That doesn't say that doesn't say um, you know anything unusual about British society, but I think it does say something that if someone is prepared to leave a, a spouse having broken promises to them, then I think it says something. You know, if they're prepared to do that, about what they're prepared to do in you know to the public. If they can do that to a spouse, could they not do that to us? And you know, this is this is where we are. I think that. You know, we need people with integrity, with personal m morals and integrity and faith. Uh, and I'm not sure that Richard Tice is the person that I could trust in, in that respect, which is not to say I'm sure he's a you know, perfectly nice person. Uh, um, but, uh, you know, um, in an ideal world, we need someone who has, you know, real kind of um, uh, yeah, something more than that, I think. I think the issue is that the the problem that we're facing is not fundamentally a political one. The, the problem that we're facing is not fundamentally a political one. Um, now, you think about it, and I know that we've looked at this many, many times. You think about what the this secular view of the world, the secular worldview, whatever you want to call it, I, I, I don't really know to be honest, but this view is, it's pursued with a kind of religious fervour, isn't it? I think this is actually part of the problem that people are pursuing it, but they don't have a name for it. They don't realise that they are pursuing it. But it is, an, it's not just an alternate uh, set of, of facts or policies, but it is almost a, a different religion. In fact, I think it, it pretty much is a different religion. And this is why, you know, if you think about it, immigration is seen as a, a moral good and therefore unquestionable. You know, that anyone who questions immigration is seen as a kind of pariah. And I think that's why they did what they did to Suella Braverman and others, because you know, they were seen as immoral monsters for questioning, even if what they said was totally reasonable. Um, climate change, I've mentioned that already, but how climate change is seen as the, the greatest threat to humanity, an apocalyptic thing, and therefore unquestionable. Now, again, we've got these dogmas, uh, uh, immigration, climate change, transgender, you know, uh, uh, fortunately, a little bit more pushback on that in society and the government lately. But even that, you know, it's seen as this sort of unquestionable good this thing which which mustn't be, you know, you mustn't stand in the way of it. Otherwise, you're some kind of outcast. And I, I think it's why a discussion on these topics isn't seen as a free speech issue. I think it's because they are seen as just wrong, immoral values to hold. So, you know, I would say that, for example, discussions about racism, I think, well... You know, as much as I, I might disagree with people who hold right, white supremacist views, that I think, you know, we shouldn't ban people from saying things like that. But we should argue, you know, meet argument with argument. And, you know, but, but, but the problem is these people, they see themselves as being such 
in, in, on the moral right side of history that anyone who holds those outdated views on immigration and climate change and transgender and so on just has to be shut down because they are dangerous, immoral views to hold. They are heretics. They must be burnt. They must be got rid of. Um, it's, it's this kind of new religious view, you know, way of dealing with, with opponents that everything now must conform to the new secular ideology or be shut down and be cancelled. Now, the problem is when people hold these religious positions, can you reason them out of it? That's the, the million dollar question, isn't it? You know, when people hold to a religious, it's sort of in inverted commas, religious position, like believing that climate change is the worst threat to humanity, can you reason them out of it? And it's been interesting to look at, for example, in um, on GB News or in, in other places, you know, where they've had on these climate change activists, like Just Up Oil activists, and they meet their, you know, they're kind of frenzied, really, about climate change, and, and they meet their hysteria with just some facts and logic, and there's no reasoning with them. That you, at the end of the day, these people can't be reasoned with because they hold a religious belief, not a, a logical and moral you know, kind of um, rational one. It, it's deeper than that. It, the, the place which we have it as human beings made in the image of God, we have a place for morality and righteousness and belief and faith. You know, that's it's right and good. But what's happened in these people is that this secular religion has taken over and has made them impervious, I think, to, to actually changing. Um, and this is why that anyone else who disagrees has to be shut down and treated in this way. Now, the problem is, a, I say the problem is, the thing is that a religious problem needs a religious solution. A religious problem needs a religious solution. That if we try to sort out this religious problem with politics or with education, just with more facts, with more evidence and so on, we're not going to make any headway or very little headway. What we need is something which can actually change minds. What if, what if the people who adhere to this new religion, this new sort of secular religion, actually changed their minds and started voluntarily doing the right thing. So what if the government didn't have to battle the civil service to get it to do the right thing, but the civil service voluntarily, to some extent, started doing the right thing? Institutions started to do the right thing. You know, that energy companies and so on started to do the right thing rather than forcing them to do that with regulation. It was self-regulation in a, in a sense rather than government regulation. So rather than there being a, a top-down imposition of the rules of, of legislation, there was a bottom-up kind of outworking of right values and just thinking about what's best and thinking about you know, how we can look after people and do, do the right thing, basically, integrity and honesty and, and all of those things. Wouldn't that be more effective in the end? And I say more effective, isn't that the only thing in the end which is going to be effective, the, the only thing which is actually going to affect change, meaningful change, is if people themselves do the right thing. Now, that is what the Bible talks about. Just in, um, on my other channel on Understand the Bible, I've been preaching through the book of Romans. And last week, we had the verse, a famous verse in the Bible, this Romans chapter 12, verse 2. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Which is, I always think, is a, a verse full of hope, because... Now, this world does have a pattern. This world does have a, if you want to call it that secular religion, that's the pattern at the moment, isn't it? The pattern of the world, this kind of secular religion. But uh, Paul says, don't conform to that pattern, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. 
And that's something that God can do. God can transform us and change us, that we don't have to conform to everything that we're told to conform to in this secular age. But we can we can change. Now, this brings me to a question that someone asked me uh, this week about Paula Venels. Because Paula Venels, um, you may, well, as, as I mentioned earlier on, she uh, was not only the CEO of the post office, but she is an ordained um, lay minister in the, uh, I say lay, no, you're not, you're not lay minister if you're ordained, but she is like a um, ordained in the Church of England, but not in a, in a um, stipendiary role. Um, now, it seems to me that what happened with Paula Venels actually demonstrates that the Church of England, the religion of the Church of England, is not able to bring about change. The religion of the Church of England as a whole, I should say. Not the religion that it professes to believe in its, in the creeds and in the Book of Common Prayer and so on, but actually the beliefs which are held by you know, most of the bishops um, and a lot of the clergy as well. Um, let me just quote you a little bit from a Daily Mail article about Paula Venels. This is what she said. After explaining how her values came from the glory of God, she turned to the subject of making mistakes. When we mess up, which we do every day, she told the audience, my faith tells me that I can be forgiven, that shortfalls are a perfectly human thing to do, and that I can always start again, always, always, always start again. You can put things right. Has Paula Venels been a shining example of starting again and putting things right when it comes to the post office horizon scandal? It seems to me that she's not exactly done a stellar job at putting things right there, shall we say. And this is the problem, that Paula Venels might talk the talk, but does she walk the walk? And I... Um, I mean, maybe this is where I have a um, an advantage over some in that I've heard a lot of bishops talking and even clergy and people will often say things which sound very Christian, but then act in not very Christian ways. And uh, my, um, for example, my, the bishop who was who ordained me as deacon was Stephen Cottrell who's now the Archbishop of York and he if you hear him preach a sermon he will what he says will sound very good but the way that he acted like in this diocese you know cutting stipendiary clergy posts and you know just led to a very unhealthy culture I think in the diocese uh, it is completely different and I, I just feel like, you know, that don't judge someone by what they say. You know, in this case, she talks about um, uh, her values coming from the glory of God. Well, OK, how are those values actually translated into doing something, uh, doing something different when it comes to the post office? And it seems that this is the so much of the church suffers from this at the moment, this kind of tension in between what we say and what we do that, you know, she might say the right things, you know, in a conference or, or in a meeting or, or on paper, but then what she does is different. She's not different in the way that she actually behaves to the rest of the world. Or in fact, if she is distinguishable from the world, it's that she's actually worse. And that's the thing with the church, that um, I was watching a, an interview with Nancy Piercy, I mentioned her the other week, I think, um, about her new book about the toxic war on masculinity. I just started reading it. But one of the things she said was, you know, you may have heard that Christians are just as bad when it comes to divorce, when it comes to, you know, relationship problems and, and um, abuse in relationships uh, compared to the rest of the world. And she said, no, that's not true. When the researchers went back and distinguished between you know, nominal Christians, i.e. people who, you know, were just perhaps went to church but didn't really read the bible much didn't really pray much and didn't really believe much 
when you distinguish that from people who were sincere and devoted in their faith, actually the people who were devoted were the best. You know, there was the most happiness in marriage, there was the least abuse, and, and so on and so forth. But the people who were the nominal Christians were the worst, because they took Christian concepts and just sort of used it to baptise the secular values, and it just kind of took the secular and made it worse. And I think that's kind of what's going on with Paula Venels, which is that she's not got the tools, the equipment, the theological equipment to actually be transformed. All she's doing is taking the secular values of the world and baptising them with a Christian veneer, and it's making it worse. So much of the church, I think, is like this at the moment. It's not about being different to the world. It's just looking like the world, but worse. Um, but because we don't have anything different to say to the world, really, we just all we do is just try and beef up what the world says in a in a try and you know sort of a Christian veneer, which is not what we need. And you know, this is I, I see this problem with in general with cultural Christianity. Um, uh, in a world where cultural values. British and Western cultural values are now so different to traditional Christian values that people who don't really understand what Christian values are are very confused. It's And it's not surprising, is it, that that happens? And it, it's not a surprise, it shouldn't be a surprise to us, that there are many people in the world who are Christian, who call themselves Christian, but whose values do not seem to be very Christian when you look into it. And you might think, for example, of Calvin Robinson and what he said about he was interviewed when he'd been sacked from GB News, um, saying that how the some of the people at the top of GB News are Christian, like uh, Paul Marshall, but they don't seem to have acted in very Christian ways. Why is that? Well, I think it's because they, they don't know what Christian values really are. You know that, that there is a there is a disconnect there. And that's largely why I wanted to do sacred musings, you know, to think about what the world would look like with true Christian values, rather than just taking a secular world and trying to apply a Christian veneer to it. And this is why, at the end of the day, no political reform will be effective or welcome unless they're accompanied by actual transformed values. And that's what we need. You know, not political reform itself. Um... It, I think political reform is necessary, but we need more than that. We need transformed values. We need our values transformed into that of the kingdom of God. You know, that God's values, rather than just trying to take secular values and making them a bit more Christian. What we need, and this is what the church are not preaching at the moment, is that little word, repentance. That's the missing piece of it. And I appreciate that time is, is pushing on here. So let me just uh, quote you a couple of things. This is um, a definition of repentance from um, there's a website called Step, the Scripture Tools for Every Person, which, which enables you to look into the original languages of the Bible and what have you. This is what they, they say about repentance, about what it is. Change of mind, repentance. The state of changing any or all of the elements composing one's life Attitude, thoughts and behaviours concerning the demands of God for right living. Uh, note that this state can refer to the foundational salvation element in Christ or to ongoing repentance in the Christian life. So repentance is a complete changing of our minds and our attitudes and behaviours, everything in life. That's what repentance is. It's turning around from what's wrong to what's right. And repentance means that we need to look at what's wrong and we need to turn around from that and to say, I'm going to do what's right. And to do that, we need to know what's wrong and we need to know what's right. And we need to be transformed by God in order to, to see. But that's what, what we need. Repentance, real, genuine repentance is what we need. And that's the thing which the church, you will not hear the word repentance really being being preached or, you know, um, the churches do not preach repentance really, um, by and large. They teach a lot of things, but it's kind of like Paula Venel said actually, you know, when you mess up, 
when you mess up, you can put things right. And she doesn't use the word repentance. And I think that's because she doesn't really understand what repentance is. You know, it's just trying to take a secular concept, putting things right and applying a Christian veneer. But Christians believe in repentance rather than this kind of um, Christian veneer. Uh, we, we believe in something deeper and more genuine. Let me just quote to you what the New Bible Dictionary says about repentance. But whoever repents, even at the eleventh hour, whoever turns again to God, finds a God of mercy and love, not of judgment. The call for repentance on the part of a man is a call for him to return to his creaturely and covenant dependence on God. He who commits evil finds further evil willed by God. But he who repents of his evil finds a God who repents of his evil. Um, what... I was really struck by with that is just that you know to not repent leads to more evil but to repent actually breaks that cycle you know to repent breaks the cycle of evil upon evil and it 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 it, it doesn't just transform you but you know it's it's a transformative thing for society and I thought that was really helpful that you know repentance is is the thing that we need across and it will change society if people repent of sin and turn to god turn to what is right turn to what is good so is it too late to change well i think that's the wrong question uh, the the question is never about whether change is possible but rather who or what we are trusting for change real change isn't going to happen via political means but then it never was anyway you know, politics is useful in its right place, but it's never the means by which we actually change people and change societies in, in the long run, not for the better. Actually, real change is from God, and real change can always happen when God is at work. I'm just going to finish quoting you one of my favourite verses in the Bible. This is Mark 10, verse 27. Jesus looked at them and said, with man, this is impossible, but not with God. All things are possible with God. And that's a message of hope, isn't it? That real change is possible with God. And it's never too late. So I hope that that's, that's an encouragement to you. That, you know, we, we can hope for real change when God is at work. But what we need is not political action, but actually genuine repentance and that's what we need to be hoping for as we, we look ahead. Let me finish. I, I wanted to finish by um, reading a, 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 um, Jeremiah chapter 7 or part of Jeremiah chapter 7. This is um, about Jeremiah's sort of um, accusations against false religion. How it's saying that false religion is worthless. It kind of links in with what I've been talking about actually. So let me finish with this. I won't you know, talk too much about it after this. We're nearly at the end. But I, I'll just read a few, the opening uh, verses from Jeremiah chapter 7. This is the word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord. Stand at the gate of the Lord's house and there proclaim this message. Hear the word of the Lord, all you people of Judah, who come through these gates to worship the Lord. This is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel, says. Reform your ways and your actions, and I will let you live in this place. Do not trust in deceptive words and say, This is the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord. If you really change your ways and your actions and deal with each other justly, if you do not oppress the foreigner, the fatherless or the widow, and do not shed innocent blood in this place, and if you do not follow other gods to your own harm, then I will let you live in this place in the land I gave your ancestors for ever and ever. But look, you are trusting in deceptive words that are worthless. Will you steal and murder, commit adultery and perjury, burn incense to Baal and follow other gods you have not known, and then come and stand before me in this house which bears my name and say, we are safe, safe to do all these detestable things? Has this house which bears my name become a den of robbers to you? But I have been watching, declares the Lord. So what it seems was happening was that the people of Jeremiah's day were um, doing all of these terrible, you know, ungodly things. Their conduct was ungodly. 
and they were basically sticking their fingers in their ears and saying, this is the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord, blocking it all out, la, la, la. You know, this is, this is God's temple. God's going to bless us because we got the temple. That's all we need. And I, I think it does, it made me think a bit of the, this kind of Western attitude that we've got now, this Western um, arrogance. And I know we've looked at this in relation to Israel over the past few weeks, but how people just think that, the West is best because we've got human rights and because we've got prosperity and whatnot. When actually the core has gone, you know, the, the, the goodness has gone out of the, the Western world and that we don't have those things anymore. And that what we do have is just the empty shell. And yet we're standing saying, you know, this is as the almost as the Israelites were, you know, that this is the temple of the Lord. You know, God will bless us because we've got all of these trappings of it but no what what god says to them and what he says to us is that we need the reality the substance we need to seek him and do what is right you know repentance actually as we were thinking about that's what we need to repent and do what is right seek him and only then then and only then will we find the blessing that we seek otherwise we will be destroyed as a as a well as the west i think but i hope that it is not too late for that and i hope that there will be real change and that there will be genuine repentance but that is the thing that we that we need so let's take a moment to pray as we come to to the end Our heavenly father we know that uh, genuine repentance is what we need is what we all need and i pray for uh, all of us who are uh, thinking about these things, I pray that you would help us to daily repent and turn to you, turn to Christ for your help in living rightly. And we pray that the, that light would shine brightly and that many people would see and come to understand um, what repentance is and come to you themselves. And we pray, Lord, just that it would not be too late for the West, but that you would bring many people from um, across society to repent and turn to, to you, to the ways of righteousness, to do what is right, that you would break this evil spirit which hangs over us, this um, secular age, and that you would break through. Um, but we pray that you would help us to look to you day by day and uh, to be trusting and humble in your ways and look to you always. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, thanks so much, everyone, for joining me today. Uh, don't forget, if you'd like to support me, it's Give, Send, Go now. Not buy me a coffee, Give, Send, Go. And um, if you'd like to get in touch, you can telegram me, email me through sacredmusingspod at gmail.com or just leave a comment and a rating review if you're on the audio podcast. Give me a like if you're on the YouTube. Apart from that, uh, God bless. I'll see you again soon.